Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome to the Next Level, conversations that propel business. This is Bob Gibbons. And I'm Stephen Nooner, and uh, I'm really excited to introduce Gary Booth. Gary is the president of InterWorks. He, uh, no, 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 he's not. Internet Works. Wow, there you go. I start there you off go. super strong. <laughs> Screwing it up from the beginning. You know, and I did that two or three times in prepping in my mind here. <laughs> he started Internet Works 27 years ago with the idea of helping companies embrace new computer networking models in concert with their specific business objectives to improve efficiency and profitability. Do they have a website? How about that? Uh, it's internetworks.com. And although the technology has changed, we're going to talk about some of the things uh, that have stayed the same and how they've evolved with it. And Internet Works is spelled Internet, and then W-E-R-X, X, yes. Dot com. Yes, yes, Internet Works. Not the web, Internet. <laughs> nice. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thanks for that. being our guest today. We uh, appreciate you being here. We always like to start off with what we call the wisdom of others. And uh, today we are going to go with Mr. Bill Gates. You provided us a, uh, a quote that you like. And uh, Bill said, "You, your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. Why is that? Well, over the years, as we have evolved... Uh, when we try not to have too many unhappy customers, but it does happen from time to time. And what we try to learn from that is where we fall down or where our gaps in our uh, either our technology or our customer service are primarily. It's so important, in, particularly in our business, to have good communication with our clients. We're, the, we're sort of their, uh, their go-to guys for all things about their data and how their communications work internally. And so it's very important that we be able to be in the same mindset as they are. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, uh, the, where in those situations where the client is unhappy, it's generally because... Uh, we haven't communicated properly either what we're trying to do or uh, what our recommendations are or what our remedies are. And so we, we try to use that as our stepping stone to say, okay, so we're, how are we going to approach our communications with our clients generally? So whenever I see that, whenever I have those opportunities, and those usually come to me mm -hmm. uh, when, when somebody's <laughs> not so happy that it all uh, rolls uphill, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, when I get those <laughs> when I get those calls and say, "Hey, we need to see you," uh, I like to go into those uh, not only with a with a completely open mind, but perhaps looking for some constructive uh, criticism so that I can take that back and and communicate that back to the staff and say, "Hey, this is this is what." they're telling me and uh, maybe we need to look at this a little differently and it's not necessarily that that the staff is looking at it and saying hey uh you know that uh, we fell down on this it's mm -hmm. more hey what's our process mm -hmm. what's our what are our procedures are we following up the way we should it seems to me most of the time it's an issue of incongruent expectations that you know the client's expectations and what you expected to provide them are not necessarily in sync. And, and so when those get more out of sync, that's where you have greater frustration. Yeah, some, some of that is managing their expectations. And, sure. and that's, a, that's a big part of what we need to do because, as you can imagine, our, uh, our business is 24-7. Uh, even though we don't all stay up all, all overnight and, and manage things, our clients' expectations is that their systems are always available. Mm. And so uh, we have to manage how they, how they communicate to us, hey, this is what I need, this is how I need it. 
So part of it is managing those expectations. The other part is making sure that whatever we tell them we're going to do, we do, and we do it consistently and always deliver what our services in the same manner. The thing that stuck out to me in the quote and just kind of as we're talking here too is just um, how freeing that is both as a leader and when someone's being led that, hey, it, something's viewed as a breakdown and then you just you're, you, you analyze it from a standpoint of if it's a system, if it's a breakdown in our process, then we just improve the process, right? It's not necessarily about you. It might be about you, but we're going to first see if it's something new that we haven't dealt with before. It's a breakdown. Well, let's fix the process and instead of beating you over the head with it like you screwed up. Or, hey, if you screwed up and you're not following the process, well, you know, then you can give really, really very good constructive feedback. And I just think that that's kind of freeing in order to – because I, I, I know – there are places and situations I've been in the past where, you know, it, it's just it, there's a process breakdown and, and and then you get killed as part of that, you yeah. know, just because everyone's reacting versus responding. Well, let's um, let's let's take a little different tack here and tell us how you got into this business in the first place, because as I recall, you didn't go to school to become a computer nerd. No, I, I kind of grew into that. <laughs> yeah. So you admit it? Yeah, well, whatever that term currently means. I think it's a badge of honor these days. Yeah, it, it could be because all the rich guys, right, are all computer nerds. That's right. No, actually, I uh, I, I started out when I was uh, early on, high school and college, in the really early days of computer science, uh, just getting my feet wet and, and enjoying the the process of programming and, and uh, just dealing with computers in general. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it, at that point, it was all what we call big iron. It was everything was in a big glass room and mm-hmm. you had to put programs in, make when they came out, renew, uh, review them. And so uh, I, I decided that I was I was interested in that, but I really wasn't interested in that, in that whole process. Mm-hmm. So I kind of switched gears a little bit and, and Actually, I went from math to management and got a degree in management, went to work for a couple of manufacturing firms, completely unrelated, really. Uh, But uh, somewhere along the line, the personal computer was introduced. I know that seems like ancient history now, but it was such a big deal back then because it sort of freed us to be able to do things that we couldn't do before that. And so some of the businesses were old manufacturing firms that were sort of going away. So I just decided at one point to, you know, do this crazy thing and just take off and and start my own business from scratch. Why? uh, Well, yeah, yeah, part of it was that I I saw this technology and I said, this is is something I don't want to pass up. I don't want to have it pass me by. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, because this was this was the computing that I thought I was I was interested in, in years college, ago. When you were studying yeah, it yeah. years ago, and so this was really what I like because I could get my, put my hands on it and work on it and do it, things in real time, which I couldn't do before. So I saw that that was really exciting to me. Uh, the manufacturing businesses, like I said, were were fading. This is this stuff that was all being moved offshore, and so. I said, hey, listen, I'm not going to have a better time to do this. Sure. Kids were little, but we just decided my brother lived in Texas, in Dallas, and I like Dallas. I moved from New Jersey to Dallas uh, because I thought it was a better business climate at that point. Mm-hmm. It definitely was. and Probably still is. Yeah, it still is. It still is. I, I, there's, it, it's, it's changed a little bit, but it's still more free and easy in Dallas than it is or in Texas than it is elsewhere. And so I started, and and it it sort of took off. So what were you? What was the problem you were solving back then for clients, and and how does that evolve? What are you guys doing now? Well, yeah, it's completely again a completely different environment. This this sure. business changes so quickly. But back then, it was just the beginning of computer networking. Now it was it was being networked in big operations in the Defense Department and stuff like that, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was at the beginning of the point where networking was becoming available or affordable for smaller businesses. Mm-hmm. And that's what was really exciting to me was I'd go in and talk to people in their businesses and say, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if you guys could 
uh, have all have access to the same data at the same time. Mm-hmm. You know, forget the internet. That wasn't even, you know, yeah. at that point it wasn't even an issue, but it was mainly, hey, can we put up a file server and have data all centrally located? And that was the exciting part. And we'd get in and talk to companies about what their business was. Because uh-huh. I was really interested in the management side of business uh-huh. and bringing technology into it. And that's what was fun to me, was to be able to, to bring that together. And how has that evolved? Like, so what does that look like today, 27 years later? Like, what, what kind of work, what's the same and what's different? Well, the the big difference now, of course, is the is the way the internet impacts everything. Sure. So that now our business really is taking our, our clients and giving them the opportunity, not only to have access to resources locally, but everything else that's on the internet, even to the point of moving their data out to the internet to a hosted a cloud hosted environment, and that's where we come in and say, hey. You don't care where the resources are. You just want to have access to them. Let's get the most efficient, most effective way for you to be able to do that, have everybody able to access that data no matter where they are, and to have access to it 24-7. You don't have to be in the office. You get to it wherever you are. So it's on tablets, phones, laptops, in, you know what we call thin clients, which are these devices that basically just connect the people to the Internet and then direct them to where their data is in a desktop and format. So is it typically like kind of a consulting arrangement? Is, and is it a long-term engagement? Or do you work yourself out of a job? Or I mean, what's the – how does that work? No, it's – the business now, in, in our business, the, the, uh, the, the way businesses are set up right now, they're, they're called managed services providers. Okay. And managed services providers basically work on a monthly retainer. Okay. They set up and say, hey, we're going to monitor and manage every device that's on your network, whether it's on your premises or in the cloud, Mm -hmm. and we're going to make sure that it's operating at peak efficiency. We're going to monitor that 24-7, so if something happens, some disconnect happens, we're going to know about it. Something happens with your servers, we're going to know about that, and we're going to maintain uh, generations of backups in the cloud. So you never have to worry about, hey, you know, I got hit with ransomware or anything like that. So it's a matter of, of, of just making sure that that process follows all the way through but, but does it on a recurring basis. Well, and then you have kind of the big threats right now with security and all that stuff. That's got to be a big deal for you guys in your space. Yes, it is. And we're constantly looking at new technologies to address that, whether it's on the desktop, on the web, you know, web traffic, or – you know, even everything that comes through email as well. Well, we're going to take a break. What do you want to talk about when we come back, Stephen? Um, I think Gary's going to share a breakdown <laughs> that every single one of us can learn from. Stick around. And now, Confessions of a Recovering Landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease, because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases, while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. Don't let landlords have all the power. As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? Hi, I'm Steven Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy, one that you can articulate, Or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? 
If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. I'm Stephen J. Anderson and the CEO of, well, a lot of professional development companies, and it's clear after my interview with Bob and Stephen today that they have never read my book, The Culture of Success. So hope you hope they read it soon. You need it. Welcome back to The Next Level, conversations that propel business. We're here with our guest, Gary Booth, and he's the founder of Internetworks, and you can learn about them at internetworks.com, and works is spelled with an E, not an O. And an X, not a K. Yeah, W E R X for those that couldn't follow that. Wow, that was that pretty was, tricky. That was very complicated. That was you've gotten two great follow introductions to the show. Oh, no. <laughs> They'll remember it, hopefully. There's yeah. Jerry Booth. Yeah. <laughs> got it. Got it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so I Bob threw me this great opportunity to give a hook. And uh, the hook was, you know, that you had a breakdown that you had shared with us that um, I felt that everybody could learn from. I think that if you haven't experienced it, you will if you're growing a business. And even if you've experienced it, it's one I think we can all be reminded of. Um, do you mind, you mind sharing that? No, no, that's fine. The uh, I think what we were talking about was the uh, – uh, it revolved around staffing. And this was uh, very early on in the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had uh, – when I started, I started by myself mm -hmm. and just started doing as much as I could. And then I, I found somebody locally who was interested in what we were doing. And he, I brought him in and, and, and basically uh, shared the, the load with him. And, uh, and that worked out great. R really good guy. Uh, worked well with the clients. Very, uh, very interested in the technology and always uh, – interested in new things and so that worked out great until he had a personal situation where he had to move out of the area mm. and that was very traumatic for me at the time and so uh, one of the things that it helped me do was to realize that this was probably not going to be the last time that I was going to go through something like this mm. and so I, I started to think about hey how can I make this so that it is not dependent even on me but just so that so that we can gain some traction and, and get continuity and it really helped me understand how I could reform how we approach things so that it wasn't dependent on individual staff members but maybe start to build some policies and procedures that would allow us to carry on and that's and that's evolved continually over time one of the things that's really critical to us is documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, documentation about our clients' networks, about their how their data is set up, and and who the people are, how how they how we need to interact with them. Mm -hmm. And so over the years, we've we've gone down different roads on that, but it's always with the idea that hey, this needs to be something that we could pick up. Somebody else could come in, pick up, and say okay. I see what's going on. I know what we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that was really important. And I think that's kind of the way I've approached staffing ever since, actually. And whenever you have a, uh, a company where all the intellectual property of the company is in somebody's head, and then that head walks out the door, what's the value left in the company? So you got to have those policies, procedures, all those kinds of things to create that continuity. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Who, who is, by the way, your, your primary client, your ideal client? Well, our... our we have a, a we can actually support just about anybody that has computers and of course that's everybody right but uh, even large organizations we are now scaled so that we can we can support large organizations it's just unusual that those large organizations would completely outsource their IT staff mm -hmm. they generally have internal staff so we have three large clients that have internal staff that we supplement or provide very specialized services to. But the ideal client for us that, that seems to work best for us is somewhere between 15 and 50 users mm -hmm. uh, because those are people that generally want to completely uh, uh, you know, outsource that IT uh, staff. And so to us then, we generally interface with one particular person at that 
business, mm-hmm. and then we can be basically the CIO of that company. And that's to me is is ideal because not only does it is it fit in well with their businesses, but it also is interesting to us because I my one of my goals coming from the management side as well as technology is to is to really put those th- two things together. And so I enjoy really learning about our clients' businesses, which is why we don't have any particular vertical market. We've, we've got people in manufacturing, finance, mm-hmm. hospitality, uh, law, medicine, everything, just about across the board because it's always interesting for me to learn about their businesses. What, what challenges do they have? And how can we per- perhaps make them more profitable? One thing that's interesting to me, what you were sharing about who your target, your the ideal client is, right? Um, or where you work well together. It's almost uh, the breakdown that you shared that we can all learn from is exactly why your business exists. They probably don't at that size. I mean, we're, we're similar size. I don't want one IT person that we are completely beholden to everything mm-hmm. single working. An organization like that has a team of people makes a whole heck of a lot more sense because – in in our business and most companies nowadays, the like, system goes down. You're well, it's safer. You're hosed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. your one IT guy goes yeah. on vacation or gets sick. You're totally hosed. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of protecting clients, we barely touched on this before the break, but let's talk about cybersecurity. That's such a huge thing, and in Stephen's world of of insurance, huge. cybersecurity insurance is huge. Um, a major major issue. So. What are the things that clients really need to be worried about most? <clears throat> if I can actually get that out. <laughs> well, they choked up about this. Yeah, Bob. That's <laughs> right. That, that really, I'm that passionate. really is, uh, yeah, really serious <laughs> about that. Now, the the uh, you, know, you mentioned insurance. The, the the two main factors that we have come up against now are are uh, PCI compliance, which is the payment card industry mm-hmm. compliance. That's for all the credit card processing and HIPAA which is the, uh, the 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 act that that governs health uh, services companies and we have we have companies in both arenas that we need to protect and it's 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 fairly rigorous and you know there's not only uh, you know you think it's all external these hackers that are trying to get in and, and get information but it's also the internal people that are uh, frequently careless about how they leave information mm-hmm. around, if yeah. you will. You know, the HIPAA says, hey, you can't have papers out on the desk that do this, but there's much more of a risk with digital information that somebody is going is, is going to inadvertently email somebody some medical records mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, or somebody's going to uh, uncover some uh, Social Security numbers or credit card numbers. And those are the things that we have to protect people from themselves, in addition to sort of hardening the perimeter so that it makes it much more difficult for somebody to get in. Hey, we all see that there are government agencies that should be well protected that get hacked. Mm -hmm. So it's not impossible. We just have to make it so it's not an easy target, mm-hmm. and it, and it's and it's less vulnerable, and that's and that's really what we we concentrate on in trying to do those things. Interesting. What are the big threats you're seeing in your industry right now? Well, it, I think everybody's probably heard of ransomware, and that becomes the uh, perhaps the thing that comes most to mind right now because it can be so damaging. Uh, there's and, and ransomware comes in and says, "Hey, uh, you know, comes in as an, as a as a fairly uh, a normal email message or or perhaps something you click on on a website, mm-hmm. and it immediately uh, infiltrates your system and locks all the files and says, okay, you want to unlock those files, you have to pay a ransom.' Which is it just sounds crazy, but but the technology is available to do that, unfortunately. Mm. So the uh, and and what we can do is is we keep putting new tools into effect that are help detect those things, mm-hmm. uh, like some of the stuff that we do with email now that says, hey, if you get an attachment that comes through, uh, they, they will put it through a filter that will actually open up the attachment and look at what it does before it sends it over to you. Wow! Oh. So it's so that kind of technology that we're 
we're putting into place to prevent that. And then you can't prevent everything, so the, the, the next thing that you have to do is to make sure that you're always backing up the data, putting it off-site, can uh, keep generations of data so you can always go back, hey, I'd give, it, give it to me a week ago, give it to me a month ago. Mm-hmm. We keep doing that so that we can always have some sort of backstop to, to, the, uh, to the client's data. Makes sense. So we're, uh, you know, getting closer to the end of our time. But one thing I was um, curious about is I, I know, um, you know, you had mentioned that there was some some advice that you got early on in the business that that you'd act on really made a big big difference in your business. So, yeah, well, you know, part of the reason I got into this business was was because I like the technology and the management side. The other part is that I wanted to do do it myself. Uh-huh. You know, I'd worked for other companies, bigger companies. And it's, it's, it's interesting and it's, it's, it can be rewarding, Mm -hmm. but I, I really enjoy the, the sort of the independent part of that. And, uh, I have my, my, uh, uncle, uh, who is a management consultant, uh, pretty prominent. And he gave me advice early on. He said, Hey, get in, get involved with Toastmasters. Toastmasters. Yeah. And it seemed like a, yeah, yeah. I mean, where you could get up, actually, they, they, they forced you to get up in front of groups and speak. Not only speak prepared text, but uh, extemporaneously, and that to me uh, was one of the what the, sort of the watershed moments was when I I got into that and started to feel really comfortable doing that because you find out that hey everything you do as a business owner is mm. selling mm. whether you're selling you're selling your your ideas to your uh, staff mm-hmm. or selling your products to your clients or in some cases, because you're, we're smaller than a lot of our vendors, mm-hmm. we have to sell them on the idea that we can properly present their products to, the, to, the, to our clients. And so all of that requires being able to speak very distinctly and informatively. And I think that was really helped, helped out early Do you think on. they have room in one of those classes for Stephen? Uh, I don't know. Well, you know, it, it depends upon whether you, uh, you don't have to read. <laughs> they may not know, let so me in, probably right? Probably okay. <laughs> yeah. Extemporaneously. It's yeah, so funny. Well, right. I was going to think of that same joke, Bob. It's I know. Like I, I was trying to beat you to it. <laughs> right. Um, all right. Real rapid fire. Best app on your phone? Oh, it's probably Waze. Okay. It's the way that I get around town. It's easy. I love that one. I use it all yep. the time. Yep. It's great. Uh, best app on your computer? Uh, I probably use uh, Strava a lot, which is because uh, uh, I ride I ride my bike a lot, and that's uh, that helps me keep track of all that. And I I really love that. Actually, I share that with my my son who's in Boston. He likes that. Very cool. Well, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. Uh, for our listeners, please go to internetworks dot com. W e r x. There you go. Go to yes. inter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nextlevelshow.com for more on the show spread the word see you next week have a good week Excellent. thank you you have been listening to the next level conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level